Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Welcome to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon. Today is Monday, December 2nd. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you had a fabulous break. Um, I enjoyed my two days away and we're back in the saddle. Uh, let's jump right in. I want to play a clip for you of Mayor Pete in one of his recent advertisements uh, explaining why we don't want to pay for college for rich kids. Um, I want to go over that and then I want to explain to you why this particular messaging is so insidious. And if people don't understand the vitriol and admittedly the ire that we are throwing towards Mayor Pete, um, you'll understand once we get done breaking it down. Let's start with the clip. I believe we should move to make college affordable for everybody. There are some voices saying, well, that, that doesn't count unless you go even further, unless it's free even for, for the kids and millionaires. But I only want to make promises that we can keep. Look, what I'm proposing is, is plenty bold. I mean, these are big ideas. We can gather the, the majority to drive those big ideas through without turning off half the country before we even get into office. And that, I think, is the best governing strategy, as well as what it's going to take in order to win. And Lord knows we got to win. I'm Pete Buttigieg, and I approve this message. So the basic premise of this advertisement is that we will turn off half of America if we go so far as to say a program like, well, essentially, I mean, both of his his programs, which is um, he's opposing Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders's college for all, as well as uh, Medicare for all. And he's suggesting that their programs, because particularly the college program pays for the tuition of or provides free state college tuition for children of millionaires, that's going to turn off half of America. And online, online, his community, in case that wasn't salient enough, his communications director, Liz, um, I forget Liz's last name, um, but she clarifies. She said, if you want to pay for tuition for the children of CEOs and millionaires, then Mayor Pete isn't the candidate for you. OK, now, specifically from his website, here's here's his breakdown. He wants to provide free college for those who need it. Pete will this is directly from his website peteforamerica.com uh, he says Pete will make public tuition free for 80% of American families including all families earning up to $100,000 and many middle income families with multiple children he will also provide substantial tuition subsidies for students uh, from families earning up to $150,000 and require the states improve affordability for all students all right now at first glance People are like, well, Ben, what's wrong with that? That actually sounds good. Well, OK, we have to discuss. <clears throat> Let me just make it as, as plain as I can. If you're making one hundred thousand dollars a year or a hundred, even one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and you have a family of four, which is what he's discussing, you're not rich. And quite frankly, that is the group who should be pushing for Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Medicare for all slash college for all. The group of people who make between $100,000 and $150,000 a year absolutely should be the most vocal advocates for these programs because you're not rich. You're not. Unless you can pay for college cash and unless you can pay for your to uh, your co-pays, premiums and deductibles without breaking a sweat. And, uh, and unless you make enough money to go the distance with a long term sickness. You absolutely have more in common than with the working class than someone who's actually rich. I, I honestly, I will push that envelope a little bit higher, like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. You're not rich. What determines if you're rich is really can you survive? <laughs> can you survive a crisis without going bankrupt? What has happened in America is that there's two things. I'll talk about the the problems with means testing in general in a moment. But I have to establish something. The problem in America is that we get excited when we get just above poverty, right? A family of four making $100,000 a year, I can guarantee you from personal experience, combined income between my wife and I, when we lived in, I just give you my example. Between my wife and I, we made $110,000 a year when we lived in Boston. And we lived on the in, not even inside the city. We lived in the suburbs like we lived way like 20 minutes, uh, 20 miles, which is an hour drive from the city. 
and we could not survive. Most of those times you're watching videos of me uh, <laughs> in, in my living room, man, we were struggling, seriously struggling. Now, somebody's going to say, well, everyone should just move from the cities. Yeah, you have to have money to move, right? Moving to Atlanta, which was absolutely a great financial decision for us, was extremely expensive. But I digress. Back to the point, making $110,000 a year, you make just too much to get any benefit from the government. You will not get subsidies. You will not get what you, you will not get assistance. No, what you're going to get, you're going to be paying taxes at the end of the year. That's what it is. So people were making over, and, and, and I think, I, I think this strategy is the means testing strategy is a definitive tool to sow animosity between people who are just getting by and make them hate people who are poor enough to actually get the benefit. This is what I mean. In my class, in my, and, and, and actually let me rephrase this. I, I, I want to say this before I even keep going. If you're making $150,000 a year and you have a family of four, you have more in common with the working class than you do rich people. So for the love of God, I need people who on paper, you're excited about your six figures. When it comes to when the rubber meets the road, you are in a bigger bind than some some poor people. Because you're going to owe taxes at the end of the year. You got to write a check for that. You're not going to get any subsidies to help you with your your health insurance. So you got to pay full price for that. You're not going to get any subsidies to help you with child care. You have to pay full. For I mean, seriously, I think one of the number one problems in America is that we are completely deluded into thinking that we are doing good when we make break over one hundred thousand dollars a year. And I know I listen, I've been in all of these categories. I have never been rich, but I've been extremely poor. I know what it is. I mean, hell, if I could tell you all of my stories. But let's just say I know what it's like to be on welfare personally as an adult. I know what it's like to be on welfare as a kid, as an adult. And I also know what it's like to be making over one hundred ten thousand dollars a year in my family. And I can tell you this. I was extremely grateful for those years that I did not make over one hundred thousand dollars because it actually helped out to be able to get some freaking assistance and the years where I was making with my wife and I combined making over a hundred thousand dollars, we struggled like, and we had nothing left over at the end of the year. That's the kicker. See, we talk about wealth and we talk about income. Forget about your income. How much do you have left over at the end of the year? If you don't have enough money left over at the end of the year to pay for your kids tuition cash, you need to support college for all. Period. If you don't have enough money left over at the end of the, end of the year, we're not even talking about vacations. Nobody's going on a vacation making $100,000 a year for a family of four. With a family of four making $100,000 a year, I just need to emphasize this. I, I, I know there's a lot of people in my audience who have never made that amount of money. I've been the person who's lived a good portion of his adult life without making that kind of money. And I know $100,000 a year sounds like it'll fix all of your problems. But if you've got a family and you're only getting bringing in a household income of $100,000 a year, you need to you absolutely have more in common with the working class than anybody else. Because at the end of the year, you have nothing left over. After you pay for child care, <laughs> you're probably in debt in the overdraft. So we, we I, I need to establish that first, because I think one of the things is, is that people and, and it's not really it's not uni, it's not bidirectional. It's not that the working class is yelling at people who are making one hundred one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year and calling them the bourgeois. Not necessarily. I don't think that happens. What happens more often than not is somebody who's making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year actually thinks they're part of the bourgeoisie. And they're not. <laughs> You're still a working class bloke and you don't even realize it. Because you have enough money to go to a nice restaurant one time a month or something. So it, it's that group. This 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 podcast, this episode is specifically for that group that just is on paper. You look like you're doing good. You got enough to flex. You got enough to to floss like you got enough to make people think that you're doing you're not doing good. 
not with a family with small children. You have to pay for child care and then you have to, you know, especially if you're a small business owner. Like I hate that phrase. But if you have your own company and you're and you're paying for your insurance through the marketplace, through Obamacare marketplace, my you are in a really bad position and you don't even realize it. So I have to establish that first. Because the people who should be advocating for Medicare for all the most and for college for all the most are the people who generally probably think that they're doing good. But ask yourself the question at the end of the year, did you have enough money left over to pay for your kids tuition cash? Because if you didn't, you should be advocating for college for all. And did you have enough money to survive a medical crisis cash? If you didn't, You should be advocating for Medicare for all. Get some solidarity, some class solidarity about you. When I come back, we'll finish discussing Mayor Pete's problem. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. Okay. It is the first of the month. Special thank you to every single patron who who stuck it out with me. (laughs) Special shout out to our newest patrons, Michael Aloff. Thank you for becoming a patron. Barbara Rice. Thank you so much for becoming a patron. I think I follow you on, on, um, on Twitter, Barbara. I want to make sure that I follow everyone who's a patron. So hit me up on Patreon or in discord and let me know your Twitter handle. Make sure I'm following you. But also I want to give a special shout out and I don't, I, I want to tell you, I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, what I'm getting ready to say. I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons who could not afford to stay with me this month. I know that sounds weird, but here's what I mean. Like, you know, they're there every month when it's time to renew, um, it charges a person's card. And honestly, sometimes people just don't have the money that month. And so, you know, it gets declined. And I'm not going to I'm not obviously I'm not saying this to put anyone on blast whatsoever. I want those people to know how much I appreciate them because I understand. And this adulting thing is a MF, man, like money is tight sometimes. So I don't want anyone out there who's listening to my show who could not afford to remain a patron. I don't want you for a second to feel any kind of way. I want you to stay in our discord. Obviously, I don't know who you are specifically and no one else would know who you are. Stay in our discord. Make sure that you're, you know, you're getting as much benefit as you can because you supported me. You've already supported me. And I really, really appreciate that. And whenever you can come back, obviously, we'd love to have you back. Um, So thank you to those people who are patrons and could not afford to be a patron this month. Um, I got mad respect and mad love for you. Special shout out to everyone who's still on board. Um, We can't do it without you and to all the newest patrons. Okay. Um, The reason I understand um, cards getting declined so well is because I know, man, I know what it's like. I listen as an adult. I've been on welfare. I've been on unemployment. I have made over six figures by myself. um, And I've been in a situation where I've had to leave corporate America to take care of a family while my wife uh, took the responsibility for the bills. I've been in every financial situation except for rich. Right. And I also know that once you make over a certain salary, you get excited and you think, oh, I'm doing good. And then at the end of the year, you realize, hell no, I wasn't doing good at all. And I need for I need the class solidarity to expand. Our class solidarity has to expand to include people who are pre bourgeoisie. Like you're honestly in most Cities in America, if you're not making over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, you're struggling. And the problem is you're really not going to get those salaries in rural cities. You know, you're not going to get that in the south a whole lot. If you get that in the south, you're doing great. You're probably you probably are doing great. But you still have to ask yourself the fundamental question. Could you afford to pay for your kids tuition cash every year? And can you afford a a medical crisis, an extended medical crisis cash with all the premiums, deductibles, copays? If you cannot afford that, then you should have solidarity with the working class and you should be promoting Medicare for all as well as college for all. And this is why Mayor Pete's program is particularly bad and his approach, his language, his messaging is insidious 
because what it does, it hurts the people who are vulnerable and don't even realize they're vulnerable. At $100,000 a year, which is a cutoff, you cannot afford for a family, not an individual, but for a family, he has a cutoff. You cannot afford to pay for your kid's tuition and you better be hoping they get a scholarship. At $150,000, which is the cutoff for uh, subsidies and support, you still can't. If you've got three kids, you're not going to be able to pay for your child's tuition and you better hope they get a scholarship. But that's the cutoff for Mayor Pete's plan. And it 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 takes the people who will fall into the gap. I, there's got to be some 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 literature on this. If not, I guess I need to go write the literature because there's a group of people in America who are literally the target of the IRS. But they don't get anything from this country. See, millionaires and billionaires, they have enough tax accountants and they make enough. They, they make enough to have uh, to take advantage of the loopholes. That's how they can make. That's how they make uh, millions and millions of dollars. And they they barely blink at that. I mean, even if they do pay some money at the for, at the end of the year, it's like if you made if you made 10 million and you paid three million, you still have seven million left over. You're still doing good. I'm talking about those people who make one hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty, hell, even two hundred thousand. You got a family of four and you owe money at the end of the year. That is who Mayor Pete's plan is going to hurt the most because you're going to be paying taxes without getting any benefit from this system. And what and this is why his plan is so bad. What is going to inevitably happen is that you who make one hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year are going to be paying taxes at the end of the year. And you're going to realize every year you're going to get a reminder that you cannot get any benefit from this country. And who are you going to take that out on? Are you going to take it out on the richest? No, you're going to take it out on the working class. And that's what means testing programs always do. It, it pits, it pits the, the middle class against the working class because the middle class is making too much money to get any benefit. And the working class is getting the benefit. And the reality of it is that's why we need universal programs. It's not a question about the children of CEOs and the children of millionaires. They're paying for their kids tuition cash. It's a question about the middle class and the lower middle class people who pay taxes, federal income taxes every year and get no benefit from this country. Those are the people who Mayor Pete. That's who he's targeting. Those are the people who are going to bear the brunt of this. And yet what makes his language so insidious is that he's he's using the language of class warfare against the rich to wage class warfare against both the middle class and the working class, because this is how it plays out. The resentment changes consensus, the resentment that the middle class will have towards the working class who gets the benefit. Right. If you're making less than one hundred thousand dollars a year, you'll get free college underneath Mayor Pete's plan. You're making over $100,000 a year. You're not going to get uh, uh, college, free college under Mayor Pete's plan. But what that does is changes consensus and it creates a program that is inevitably going to be underfunded and eventually cut in the long run. That is what happened to welfare in this country. That's exactly what uh, um, uh, Bill Clinton instituted with the Welfare Reform Act. And what happens? The working class ultimately gets shafted. And who gets away scot-free? The millionaire's kids, the millionaires that Mayor Pete wants you to be mad at, they don't give a damn about these programs because they're paying cash. They have enough money to take one account from uh, uh, from an investment that they made 20 years ago that's been sitting idle. And they took that and only took probably 0.1% of that account to pay for their tuition for all four years. That's wealth in this country. I mean, the CEO is able to pay for his kids tuition with a side account that nobody even knows about that is that has enough money in there that but I mean, but it won't be missed. It's like he took he takes his money that he would otherwise give his mistress and takes about 10 percent of that and pays for all four years of tuition. Do you think those people give a damn about a college for especially tuition to a state school? They're not going to a state school. So maybe 10 rich kids end up going to a state school for free 
So what? So what? Because all of the middle class who otherwise would not be able to pay for college and would go into debt, they will be going for free. So the argument is so disingenuous, but it's insidious. Here's here's the insidiousness of it. Not only the language, not only the language um, pretending as though he's waging war, class warfare against the rich, when in reality, Pete is waging class warfare against the middle class and the working class in the long run. But what makes this particularly insidious is the fact that Mayor Pete is trying his hardest to convince you that what he's doing is for the best of everybody When in reality, he has to know it would be feckless incompetence for him not to know. There's no way he doesn't know that his plan is setting us up for failure in the long run. He's setting up a program that will inevitably be gutted. And so and and so I have to ask the question, like, why would he take this positioning? Because I know he knows what I know and what I just laid out. And the only explanation is that he's taking this positioning because he's doing it on behalf of lobbyists. Joe Biden released his plan. He's calling for new subsidies to make Obamacare coverage cheaper. He's calling for a new public option uh, with a Medicare-like program. You don't agree with this approach. Why is that, Senator? Well, I don't agree for a couple of reasons. I think the time is now uh, when we have got to do what every other major country on Earth is doing and guarantee health care to all people as a human right. The most cost-effective way to do that is through a Medicare for all single-payer program. The system that Joe and others are trying to prop up is the most wasteful, bureaucratic, and expensive system on earth. We have 80 million people, Don, who are uninsured or underinsured, and yet we end up spending almost two times as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country. The function of health care in America today is to make billions in profits for the drug companies and the insurance companies we need a health care system designed to work for ordinary Americans, not make the CEOs of the drug companies even richer than they are. Listen, I was all for Obamacare at the time. Um, I've actually been on Obamacare um, at, at a certain point, and then I couldn't afford to continue the payments for Obamacare. Uh, and just this morning, this morning, I just finished filling out a form that I needed to send to the IRS um, to finish up my taxes that I filed late. Um, and one of those forms was about um, my uh, my health care coverage. And when I tell you the complexity of these forms now, I'm not giving you I am not going to give you a Republican talking point. But there is some truth in this, the complexity of these forms and the ridiculousness of the red tape and the bureaucracy compared to what other countries are doing makes absolutely no sense when we're not getting the maximum benefit to give you a bad comparison, one of the reasons I stopped teaching was because of the red tape and the bureaucracy was not commensurate with the pay. And I can tell you that the red tape and the bureaucracy around Obamacare is not commensurate with the with the benefit from it. It's not. And the fact that we create these subsidies and these loopholes and these exemptions and these credits, we're doing all of that ridiculous hurdle jumping in order to prop up a system that's fundamentally broken. That's what Bernie Sanders was trying to convey in that last clip. Our system is fundamentally broken and it is designed to maximize profits for for corporations, for CEOs, um, for lobbyists at the expense of people, their finances and their health and their well-being. That's fundamentally broken. What's extremely frustrating about this, though, is trying to convey to people who are victims of this system and helping them to understand that you are actually a victim of this system. But the talking points and the propaganda is so rich and so pervasive that people who would otherwise benefit tremendously from a Medicare for all program 
they are staunch advocates against it for two reasons. Number one, because they believe the government should just be out of everything. The government can't do anything effectively or efficiently. No, the reason the government is the reason there's so much red tape wrapped up in Obamacare is because we tried to put a band aid on a bullet wound. The bullet wound is simply for profit health care. Doing everything that we could to prop up this system, doing everything that we possibly could to make sure that we don't gut this system and start with something like Canada or the UK has. The other people who don't believe like they they really buy into the propaganda that more is less and less is more, that the more we give access to health care, the less quality, the lower quality we would have. And, 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 and it just blows me away because embedded in that argument is the is the is the realization. <laughs> no, let me restart that embedded in those types of arguments is the admission that you really want a caste system in which only people who have enough money can benefit from this healthcare system and everyone else just, you know, too bad. That's really what you're saying, because if if your fear is reduced quality because too many people get access, then what you're saying is you will not increase quality for a very few. If that's what you want, then you should just admit that. But keep in mind, <laughs> if that's what you believe, if you believe that the quality is going to go down because we have too many people in the system You do realize unless you're actually bringing home a few million every year, unless you're bringing home like an obscene amount of money and can afford to compete with all of the uber rich people, then you're setting yourself up for failure. You don't make enough money to actually compete in a gradiated system. Not for healthcare. Look at college. You don't have enough money to send your kids to the top tier schools. So what are you going to say? Because I can't send my kids to the top tier school, I don't want them to have free access to state schools. See, that's one of the number one things we have to overcome. People don't really understand their position in this country. You are not rich if you're making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. You're not rich. You're closer to making thirty thousand dollars a year than you are to making twelve million dollars a year. You're not rich. But but our society has We fool ourselves. How many people out here think that they are rich and identify with the richest people in this country when in reality you're one paycheck away from being homeless or maybe two paychecks? And I know, I know, I know to a lot of people you hear $250,000 a year and you're like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money when you don't have any money. But our system is uniquely designed to target that group. They are going to be paying taxes every single year and they will receive no benefit from it. And if they don't have enough money at the end of the year to pay for tuition cash, to pay for some type of medical emergency cash, as well as try to save for their retirement, then they have more in common with us than they do the millionaires and billionaires that they fancy themselves to really be. But you're not you're not a millionaire. It's a delusion. It is a delusion that that sows discord, but also uh, animus. It's it's a delusion that makes people who make two hundred thousand dollars a year think that they're better than poor people when you actually have more in common with poor people than you do millionaires. Class solidarity, people. inextricably combined. You, uh, as I said before, racism, in terms of its uh, uh, material base, means super-exploitation economically. It means that, that, that uh, black people get the worst uh, of the entire lot economically. It also means that the capitalist, the boss, is able to divide um, black workers 
from white workers. Why? Because he tells, he tells the white worker that his problem is not those who control his lives, those who take his labor and turn it into profit for themselves, but his problem is, is uh, uh, the black man who's trying to get his job. This weekend, the New York Times put out a piece by Ross Dolthat. I guess that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, he is a conservative columnist. He's been with the New York Times for quite some time, and he has a fixation for conservative social issues. Uh, even more so than conservative economic issues, he is the one of the leading voices in promoting conservative social issues. And he put out an article supportive of Bernie Sanders saying the case for Bernie Sanders and the the underlying thesis or not even underlying. But the, the, his main point is that Bernie Sanders can unify quite a few people, but the way he can unify them is with his messaging that um, avoids those social issues that are problematic for conservatives. In other words, this conservative columnist is saying that Bernie Sanders might be the man for the job because he's not going to stoke the culture wars around some critical issues like abortion. And if you extrapolate from that, um, any social issues for that matter, like race, um, he's going to focus on class uh, and not, you know, exacerbate the divide on LGBTQ rights. Um, I played that clip from Angela Davis from I, I think and shout out to Dr. Uh, Manhattan on Twitter. Uh, his handle is uh, at the new thinker with two R's. He shared that clip and it was perfectly timed for what I wanted to discuss this morning. Um, what. The reason I play that clip of Angela Davis is because it has to, it must be at all times, race and class, neither to the detriment of the other, not to allow race to be used um, in a weaponized way, but also to not be class reductionist. But to to juxtapose what Angela Davis was saying with this article um, it's a little problematic to me that so many Bernie supporters are like, yeah, this is look at this. Hey, this is great. Uh, we have a conservative who's supporting us. But at what cost? Right. I want to be clear, like, even though I don't know how to pronounce Ross Dothat's last name, I'm very familiar with his work. And he is above all else preeminently concerned with abortion and LGBTQ rights from a conservative perspective. And so. This is not an endorsement that is a glowing endorsement, in my opinion. It is one that should be set aside into a category of thanks, but no thanks. Because anyone who thinks, number one, I don't think Bernie is going to, I don't think Bernie is going to ignore those issues. That's my first instinct. While I know he has had problems historically with successfully discussing race and class, he has not had a problem discussing LGBTQ rights. He's never had a problem discussing a woman's right, unequivocal right to an abortion and the problems that he has had about race. He has been pretty diligent about addressing and, and um, fixing his language and to addressing those issues better. I mean, and it has not come easily like I'm, I'm stuttering and hesitating because it has been an extreme labor of love to get Bernie to speak effectively on race. And the problem I'm having with this article is that particularly the people who don't see a problem with this, the very last thing that we need from Bernie Sanders or any candidate for that matter is for them to shy away from the cultural issues. Two reasons they are, they matter. But the second reason is, do you honestly think conservatives are going to let anybody, any, any progressive or any liberal or any Democrat for that matter, skate by on social issues? Conservatives know the political capital that they get from exacerbating those divides. So they are going to always push that wedge as far as they possibly can. And what are we saying on economic issues? We're saying, and follow me, stick with me because this, this is a good point. <laughs> if I say so myself, if on economic issues, we are yelling at the democratic establishment and we're saying, don't 
dare capitulate on economic issues because no matter what you do as a Democrat, they're always going to call you a socialist. Right. They're going to call they called Barack Obama a socialist. They called Hillary Clinton a socialist. Hell, they think Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, I'm a capitalist, is a socialist. And they push that because they know they can get Democrats to capitulate and move further to the right. If we understand that's the game that they play economically, why would we not expect them to play the same game culturally? They are going to play that game. And so the problem is, is if we allow for any candidate, including Bernie Sanders, to tiptoe, to be milk toes, to straddle the fence on social or economic issues, Republicans are going to run up the scoreboard, pushing the envelope to the right. That's what they've done economically for years. They will do the same thing socially. We have to take an unequivocal, hard stance on economic as well as social issues. One, because no matter what we do, Republicans are going to label us. They will label Bernie Sanders as being an advocate for partial birth abortions. They will and they will have no doubt. They will have no hesitation about doing that. So why should we as supporters of of Bernie Sanders or any Democratic candidate for that matter, be okay with a, a, a an endorsement that's saying we will love you, Bernie. This is what they're saying. They're saying conservatives will love you, Bernie, if you just just don't don't worry about cultural issues. When we know that is a goddamn lie, and they will call Bernie Sanders a baby killer, a eugenicist. They are going to label him extreme, no matter what, because that is their political playbook. But setting the politics aside. We have a moral argument on every single one of these cultural issues. And if you're afraid of confronting the moral argument for them, if you're afraid and you're timid, then you're not what we need in this season. You're not what we need right now. We don't need people who are going to equivocate on LGBTQ rights. We sure as hell don't need people who are going to equivocate on race issues just in order to pander to conservatives. If you know that economically, then you also know that culturally. And the question is, are you willing to sacrifice the cultural element? And if you are, are you really an ally? The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Subscribe.